recorded live from Portland, Oregon. It's the Transamorous Network Podcast. Let's get it on. It's the Transamorous Network Podcast. I'm Perry. I'm Remy. And I'm Shannon Scott. And today we have yet another fantastic guest. A wonderful guest. He's he's um, married to one of the most prominent trans women in the United States, if not the world. Yeah. Um, and he's also a member of the Trans Supportive Brotherhood. All right. The group that uh, was created by a guy you our know pre- well. Yes, our previous well. guest, our, Jonathan. It is our previous guest, yeah. Jonathan. That's right. And a guest that we're going to have on next, next. Troy. Mm-hmm. And so um, let's have a shout out and a welcome to William. William. Well, hey, William. Nice to see you. Hello, hello. <laughs> Doing great. Great. It's good to have you on the show. It's funny we started that way because I'm used to starting the other and way. And that's why I jumped in. Good job, Remy. <laughs> so, William, welcome to the show. You are, um, as I understand it, you are married to a trans woman. Yeah, actually, my wife is uh, Nikki Aragus Lloyd, who um, had a rather famous uh, court battle. Um, oh, my God. Actually... Is that your wife? Yeah. The, the one who is, is that the, the person who was married to the firefighter or wanting to get married? Yes. To the, oh yes, God. she was. <laughs> You're a freaking celebrity. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, my, wife is, my wife is rather, rather, rather famous. Wow. So, and uh, need to say, actually, if her court case was not in Texas, she her case would have probably likely have been the case that... Uh, Secured uh, marriage equality throughout the whole U.S. Okay, her so- case is very. Uh, it has it has a few uh, unique aspects to it. Um, her late husband was a firefighter who died in the line of duty. Subsequently, post mortem, uh, Texas nullified their marriage, and um, she fought to have uh, their marriage recognized, which she was successful in doing. Even before uh, marriage equality was the law of the land, <laughs> and um, after marriage equality was, uh, needless to say, secured, you know there was really, really no more sense of any repeals. But uh, sadly, Texas appeal system they didn't um, they didn't pick up her case as uh, I guess as quickly as some other cases. Her case started in 2010. Um, you know, way before, way before the case that secured, way before the Obergefell o- 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 uh, case that even started or anything, um, way before Windsor even started her case that knocked down Doma. Um, however, the sad part about it is, is Texas Supreme Court never heard my wife's case and never picked it up. And mm. that really stalled out the uh, the progress of it for a number of years. Eventually they did, but it was it was too late to put it at the front of the line. Now the unique thing about her case was um, she was ruled to be in a same-sex marriage while having a female birth certificate married to a to a six gender man and uh, she also had a vagina so it's, it's <laughs> It's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, how the hell does this, does this transgender woman with a vagina, how is it illegal, how is it an illegal marriage that she's married to a man, but would be a legal marriage if she's married to a cisgender woman with a vagina? It makes, it makes no sense. Um, no, and it really, that you know, make it really sense. has a well, good juxtaposed position about, <laughs> wow. you know, what the hell really constitutes, uh, what the really, hell really constitutes, you know. The definition of gender and why you know it, it no matter what it boils back down to the fact that any two people should definitely have the right to be married absolutely but, um, regardless you know yeah, absolutely so you know that's the that's the only constitutional argument that you can ever have in the end case but you know for people that say you know idiotic things like you know two men shouldn't be married or two women shouldn't be married it definitely needless to, needless to say uh changes the whole situation, you know, if that's your position and you're arguing now for uh, two women with vaginas to be married, it makes no sense. If you're interested in delving in more on my, the story of my wife, it's she's an easy Google. You can Google her name, Nikki Aragus Lloyd, or an even e- easier Google, 
is to put the transgender widow, or you can go to our website at www.americannicky.com. Perfect. And you can see everything there. Actually, too, we have a uh, we have a documentary that we recently uploaded on that oh, wow. website as well. So, uh, www.americannicky.com. Great. So how did you end up meeting Nikki? So I actually met Nikki on Plenty of Fish of All Places. What? Wow. Actually, yeah, on Plenty of Fish of All Places. Um, you know, I like instantly tender. saw her pictures and was like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> so uh, at, well, the well, time, yeah. I, at the time, I, I was working in the oil field. I was uh, I was actually on a rig, and um, you know, my views of while I while I'd be working would be, you know, as a, as a, at the time I was a single father with 100% custody. I had a live-in nanny, and um, you know, my time offshore, I'd I'd arrange dates. Um, one thing that I firmly believe in the dating world is, you know, it's a numbers game. So you run through a lot of people, you know, and you meet as many people as you can, and eventually you find somebody that's perfect for you. And um, needless to say, when I met Nikki, she was my perfect for me match. We just linked up perfect, and ever since then we've been like magnets. So when you were when you were out on Plenty of Fish, were you specifically looking for transgender women, or were you looking for anybody? <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was just looking for a girl to link up with that I liked. Okay. Well, so I'm really interested so, in hearing. It just so happened that the girl that was my perfect match was a transgender woman. Great. I'm really interested so. in hearing more about your transition through your trans attractiveness and then your trans amory. Like, would you tell us a little bit about like how that happened? Because there's a lot of guys out there that really want to know, like, how do they own it? Like, you own it so powerfully. Well. Yeah, and that's and that's one thing. I actually I actually get um I actually it's get tons of messages and different things of that nature, because unfortunately in the world of uh, trans attractive people or trans amorous people, another term that I use is uh, trans open, which um, is really just the fact that you know you're open to dating somebody whether they're trans or cisgender and it makes no difference. Love it. And um, right. you know, so I use I use that term for me. Um, you know. I met, when I met my, my wife, it didn't, it really didn't make a difference. Um, you know, um, I, I, I liked her for her. She was perfect for me. Um, and that's regardless whether the fact that she was transgender or cisgender, it wouldn't have made a difference. You know, it wouldn't have made a difference either whether uh, she was post-op or pre-op or uh, decided to have any surgeries along the way of our relationship as well. Um, you know, and I, I think that that's also delves into something as uh, mm -hmm. when uh, when you you know when you fall in love with somebody their issues become your issues yeah um just like my wife's legal like matters and legal fights you know they they became an uh, issue that i hold near and dear to my heart as well and <laughs> so so when you yeah, were for, sorry sorry william i thought instance, you had stopped talking go ahead yeah go ahead for instance our marriage um our marriage, my wife was actually at the 13th District of Appeals, and uh, she was defending her marriage to her late husband. And, you know, the idea that I had was, you know, well, while you're defending one marriage on one floor of the, of the courthouse, we're going to have a we're going to have a wedding right there at the courthouse. And we're going to legally be married at the same courthouse on the same day. And so, you know, that, that just, that just goes into it as, um, you know, when you love somebody, you know, their issues, their fights, their battles become yours. And, um, everything that she does for the transgender community is, uh, something that I do and fight for right next to her as well. So from the, wow. from the man's I point of man, view, I'm like all teary -eyed. <laughs> I know, right? Seriously, serious, mad respect. Seriously, mad yeah, respect. absolutely. Thank you. So from the man's point of view, uh, William, the, where is this comfort coming from? Like the a guy, like I think it was Shannon that was saying, or maybe it was Remy, a guy who is who's trying to get where you are, who is struggling with the the perception of society or what their mother taught them or family taught them or religion taught them or whatever. Where where were where did you come from that has you so trans open? Or was that well, always you? A, you know, that's a personal journey for everybody. Um, you know. That's a personal journey for everybody. Everybody's going to have their own uh, 
personal fights, their own personal conclusions, and their own personal acceptance. And you know, once you once you accept yourself, you know, that's a beautiful thing. And uh, once you once you accept yourself, you know, you don't care about what somebody else's opinions of are you. You know, other people have their own life to live. You have your own life to live. The, you know, the only sensitive advice that I would give in that is, you know, people that people that you know matter. They're not going to mind, and people that mind, they don't matter. And uh, <laughs> hello, you know, I love that. You know, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> You'll, you'll realize that, um, you know, and there's casualties along the way. Um, for instance, there's family members that I have severed ties with, you know, and that's fine. Because at the same time, while I have severed family tie members, I've uh, gained a whole huger family in the LGBT family that I have now. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a give and take. And, you know, sometimes you have to have casualties and sometimes you have to let that go. So um, and then sometimes people come back. Yeah, you know, for instance, for instance, my mom, she wasn't on board at first, and you know, now my mom, uh, lifelong Republican, is you know all in the corner and all, all one hundred percent backing my transgender wife. So you know, wow, nice people. People evolve as well, you know, and sometimes, sometimes people that love you, regardless, you know, they're gonna they're gonna evolve and they're gonna mature right along with you. But you know, sometimes they might just be a few years behind, and that's okay. So William, um, William, you're you said you're you were on an oil rig, right? Yeah. Do you do that now? Well, <laughs> funny story. Um, I'm not on an oil rig anymore. You know, we're all victims of circumstance. And my <laughs> wife, um, having her late husband die in the line of duty as a firefighter, I. I'm actually a trained firefighter. I uh, knew it! Everybody on every oil rig is actually a firefighter. You're the first line of defense, you know. I mean, you don't want to have another BP incident, and, you know. I mean, it's definitely uh, it's definitely something that you're trained to give your life towards, um, to, to avoiding. But um, I was on a rig that was consistently, day after day after day, every few hours being evacuated from uh, really bad H2S releases. And this this was even being evacuated as we were wearing uh, self-contained breathing apparatuses. Wow. H2S is a very deadly gas. Um, after after that string of incidents, uh, while I was out there for a few weeks dealing with that, my wife uh, completely emotionally shut down and she said, look, if we're gonna, you know, if we're gonna move forward, which we both want to, you're gonna have to change careers. And, um, Needless to say, this really uh, bodes well for the um, for the strength and power of a transgender woman. Um, she uh, she transitioned my career from a well-paying oil field job where I was very comfortable financially yeah. and very scared to leave to uh, you know me really harnessing my dreams. Um, and now I'm a full-time artist. Holy what? shit! Yeah. What oh kind of <laughs> see what happens when loving people support each other through their the process? Of a transgender woman. Um, I love this. You know, in the right. strength of being with a transgender woman, you know, you're with somebody. You're with somebody that you know. I'm with somebody now that you know have the strength and goal to completely buck societal norms and say, "This is me. I'm going to be myself." You know, and made her own path. You know, one of the hardest things to do. You know, and through through that strength, you know, she applied that same strength in uh, changing my careers. And, uh, you know, she's been an amazing, amazing sales aspect for me, an amazing saleswoman. And, you know, needless to say, while I've, uh, while I've been, you know, doing my hobby to feed my kids, you know, <laughs> I, couldn't have, I couldn't have done it without the strength of my wife. And we've, we've been pretty successful. Um, actually president Obama owns a piece of my artwork. Um, wow. <laughs> this, is even, this is even more exciting though. Beyonce's Beyonce's family owns 18 pieces of my artwork. Oh my uh, shit. Uh, what kind so of Beyonce's old recording studios, Beyonce's old recording studios in Houston literally, literally has like huge pieces of mine, like six foot, Six foot by eight foot pieces, paintings. Things what, of that nature yeah, what kind of throughout. art? Do, what kind of art um, do you do? My highest piece is sold for thirteen thousand five hundred. I have auction records, which typically doesn't happen for somebody that's in their thirties. 
So, you know, I mean, and all that's, all that's on the shoulder of my wife because she facilitated all those sales and all those actions. And while I've been, while I've been the creative backbone, you know, one thing that most artists are not good at is uh, representing yeah. themselves as far as sales go. Yeah. It's two different brains. And, uh, you know, in her commitment to have me in a safe job, you know, she really kicked ass and, you know, really held up her end of the stick too. So, so, so. William, you're, you're a painter, obviously. Yeah. Painter painting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So the, what does your wife rep you full time or does she do something else? So, um, no, she, she reps me full time. We've, uh, we've had a gallery as well. Okay. Um, other than that, she's full time mom and you know, life's pretty amazing. Um, we, uh, <laughs> yeah, she's, she's actually, she's actually, uh, you know, just finished writing a book. Um, we've made a, we actually made a TV series, um, which we, which was our big creative baby. We were, we were not able to sell it, but, um, this was about two years ago. We made this TV series and you can, you can look it up on YouTube, uh, look up Nikki's American dream. And uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. I mean, we had all the really, really, really fun reality show stuff. Um, you know, we had fist fights. We had tons <laughs> of drinking. All the, all the really, 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 really fun stuff that you get in a reality TV. But then at the same time, you know, you had this, uh, you had this powerful transgender woman in this uh, activist aspect, which you don't typically ever see in reality aspects. So, William, um, I want to I, I get... You see art sales and artists, which is uh you know also a fun aspect thank you <laughs> hey i want to i want to get to so we talk a lot about our stories on the show and in all of our content yeah. and so i want to i want to probe a little bit about into your stories about your life so when you were a kid did your parents what did your parents what kind of do you, you understand the story what, what i'm talking about when i say stories the the things that we tell ourselves in our head that end up creating yeah. our life. Okay. So what, what were the stories that you're, that you learned as a kid that have you today living this really remarkable life? Um, well, you know, my, my grandma was actually heavily, uh, heavily a lover of art. I think I got my love from my art from one of my idols who was my grandma. And, uh, she was one of the most amazing people. And needless to say, with my transgender wife, I also know that she would hold her near and dear and they'd be like two of their favorite people together. But um, needless to say, my childhood, that was not representative of, of my childhood. Um, you know, my mom definitely does not have the same uh, aspects of art that my, um, that my grandmother did. But oddly enough, my father is a preacher. Mm. Um, oh my god! And, so yeah, I'm actually he's not surprised. A, he's a very strained relationship. I bet you're yeah, an enigma. He, this is like he this is reminds me of how I'm going to hell sometimes. And, he does. You know, we don't really. Yeah, we don't really have that. We don't really have as close of a relationship. Where we haven't seen each other in a few years, mm. and we're supposed to be uh, hanging out very soon for Easter. So, oh, wow. fingers crossed that. Yeah, good luck on that. that. I guess that that goes well. Either that or else it'll end in, uh, you know, fuck it, I'm going to live my life, whatever. <laughs> so how did you, you, you had a detour from, from, it sounds like where your grandma was really supportive of art to going into the oil business. How, what happened there? Did you decide you just needed to make a lot of money or something or what? You know, that's, that's one of the things is, uh, I was a single father with a hundred percent custody of, uh, of two little kids and, you know. Providing for them, you know, it's what fathers do. So I was very fortunate as a single parent to be able to uh, have a job that facilitated my life the way I wanted to live. I had, you know, spare cash. I I had a living nanny. That's not something that that's not something that um, you know most single parents are afforded. But needless to say, you know, that's where that's where a lot of my political views um, also originate. As far as um, you know, how we need to really create a wide web to help each other, um, and the biggest thing is, you know, my heart really goes out to single parents. Mm. Um, I cannot imagine being a single mom, especially 
you know, being a single mom working a minimum wage job and how difficult it is, especially if they don't have a strong family network to help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's that's one thing where I think that our government uh, really needs to, you know, work a lot harder and respect, um, you know, and it, it's 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 a really tough situation here. You know, you see you see things of, you know, raising the minimum wage and, you know, to me, it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a no brainer. You raise the minimum wage and, you know, every every dollar that you give, you know, a single mom is going right back into the economy. Right. So, you know, it's it's it, you know, instead of instead of giving tax deductions to people that don't really need it. You know, if you if you look at if you look at, you know, raising the minimum wage as a rebate, that's basically just going to go right back to grocers and retailers. Right. You know, it's a win win for everybody. It's just a surplus debt that's going to feed right back to the top. So, so did um, you, did you have when you were a kid, sorry to interrupt, but did you have when you were a kid or, or as you how old are you? I'm 37. Okay. So when you were in your twenties, <clears throat> did you, did you have the feeling that you would be married? I, I know you, you must've had a, did you, were you married to your wife, your child, your children's mother? <laughs> Yeah, for like a whole whopping six months. Okay, okay. So, so, so you, so you had. We actually, we actually got married. We actually got married when she was, uh, when she was uh, pregnant with my son. Shotgun. My daughter and son were born within, uh, within a year of each other. Oh wow! So we got married when she was pregnant, and then uh, pretty much right after he came out, she hit the bricks. Oh wow! She so did not want to be a mom. She was. She was uh, she was postpartum the whole uh, second pregnancy. Oh, oh. She had basically two years of being pregnant, and you know she was she was not really feeling the whole pregnancy thing. So I think this is a really so, great time to like use this as an example yeah. to to our audience who they might be in a time where they feel like there's no light at the end of the tunnel to use you as an example of just like how wonderful it can be. If you just stick to your positive attitude, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. You're like, I'm so yeah. impressed right now. Like, I know. Oh, I'm, like, we're all, I'm kind of, I'm like, like, man's man. I know. And I'm like, what the hell? And then you're like, Oh, I'm an artist now. And I, you know, I know. A dad, and I'm married to a trans woman. I'm rocking equality. And yeah. Like, it's like, I'm, like, I'm like, my mind is just like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, so, you know, I, stick to, I also, stick to the positive I story. Think, I also think that um, in a lot of hardcore jobs, like you know, oil field jobs, um, you know, and I, I as far as uh, trans amorous people and things of that nature, a lot of them have really hardcore jobs. I I've actually you know I I know policemen that are very trans attracted things what? of that nature. So That's you know not it's. It's, That's what? That's not hot. You, you have all sorts of you have all sorts of uh, you, you know different different people that are trans attracted, and that? needless to say, a lot of them are very hardcore people. Why? You know, why do you just, think that you know, is? Why do you think that is, William? Why do I think it is? Um, you know, I I I I think if you're going to be um, obviously, I think that you know. Trans attractive people that we know that are loud and vocal, like me and you, Perry. Yeah, we're the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, you know, and that's one reason why I'm as vocal as I am. That's one reason um, why I try to be as visible as I can be. Um, that's one reason why I try to, uh, you know, inspire other trans attracted, trans amorous people is, you know, to lift up the bottom of that iceberg and let more people be um, be out and open. Absolutely. William, um, I, I know, gotta say, I, I know you're not gonna toot your own horn here, but like, there's a word for this. Like, you ask this, you ask the question, why, you know, the hardcore people are, you know, the, like out and proud, and there's one word, and it's courage. And that goes to it. That goes to it because the tip of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, you know, has to be people that are extremely bold. Yeah. You know, I really, honestly, if. <laughs> You know, I really honestly don't care about what the next stranger that I meet thinks of me. You know, and I, I think that Perry that's probably important. feels that same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that is, another, that's a key. That thing, is a key another thing. Another thing with most uh, very vocal, uh, very vocal people that I know that are that are in relationships with trans people or trans amorous and are vocal about it. Most of them aren't small people, which you know, most of them, most of them, they are just fine with if the fact that they have to get in a fight they get into a fight it's okay mm -hmm. you know and that's that goes back to the tip of the iceberg the, the tip of the iceberg is going to be the boldest and what we need to be vocal for and be loud for is so that the people that are not as bold 
the people that are, you know, not willing to get into a fight or of any nature, you know, so that they feel comfortable saying, this is who I am, you know, and they feel comfortable saying that to everybody. They feel comfortable saying that to their parents, their cousins, everybody. And, um, you know, uh, if we can, if we can, if we can make ways for them, people like me and Perry, you know, we're doing a good thing. Hell yeah. 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 Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one thing that I one thing that I hold near and dear, um, especially seeing everything that my wife's gone through, is you know, you you um, you only have so much control over the obstacles that you face, but you have a dedication and an obligation to knock those same hurdles down for the next generation. And um, you know, I, I feel that there needs to be a lot of uh, a lot of stigma, a lot of hurdles, a lot of uh, public um, viewings of trans attractive people that need to be knocked down. And mm -hmm. as we all know, uh, LGBT rights and um, LGBT acceptance is only garnished through visibility. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. by no means, you know, by, by, by no means is it, you know, that we're not part of the family when you're, when you're in a relationship with the, with the transgender person, you know, you are, you are definitely, definitely part of the family, and you have that obligation to uh, promote visibility, you know, for the next person that's going to follow your footsteps. Wow. This has been an amazing 30 minutes. Right? It is so <laughs> awesome to talk to you finally in person, William. Is there, is there, right, a... Barry. thank you, man. Is there, well, let's, let's end the show here, um, and then I want to ask you a question. So don't hang up when we say goodbye, okay? All right, cool. Okay. So, men out there, this is an example. This of, is a perfect example. Yes, a perfect example of who, <laughs> what's possible for you when you step up and own who you are and not really care about what other people are saying. Because really, exactly. they don't have any impact on your life to the degree that you don't let them. So right. step it up. And uh, for you trans women out there, there are men just like William out there that you can meet and have a wonderful, productive relationship with. So don't lose hope. <laughs> Tell those positive stories. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much, you know, William. Big thing, big thing, too, before we head out, um, the people that you were just reaching out to saying, you know, transgender women, there's people out there, things of that nature. If you're ever feeling like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, just know that things definitely, definitely, definitely get better. Um, you know, when you look at when you look at suicide rates within the transgender community, just just know this. If you're young and you're struggling with thoughts, just know that things get better. Um, yeah. And just know that you have to live your life. You know, other people have their own life to live and you have your life to live. And just know that things get better if you're struggling with anything. And, you know, definitely, definitely, you're not going to feel the same way about a minor situation that you do when you're 18, when you're 30, 40. Exactly. So, Amen. Exactly. <laughs> Amen. William, I'm hugging you from Portland. Or I'm like, right, I have the biggest right. hug. Big group like, hug. All of it. All of it. Thank you so much. You're amazing. Yes. Thank you so it's, much. Oh, I've been in awe this whole thing. I've been I know. A word. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. William, you're fantastic. Right. <laughs>